Matteo, he's 10. And at the beginning of the year, he began to share that he had like a stomachache. He didn't want to go to school. He wanted to stay home. And that happened once and then twice and then the third day. And so we began to ask, buddy, what's, what's going on? And then he broke open and finally said, I, I just can't go to school anymore. What's going on, buddy? And so he shared how for the last two and a half years at school, some kids had been making fun of his name. Mateo is Matthew in Spanish. And a lot of the kids had uh, trouble saying the word correctly. And so it became the joke. They began to make fun of his name in different ways. And he was experiencing just this deep and profound shame around he, his name, his identity. He comes and sits on my lap and he's crying, sobbing. And I, I just feel unequipped to handle him at that time other than simply letting him cry and, and, and having my, my strong arms around him. And so I asked him, why don't we pray, buddy? Why don't we, why don't we bring this before Jesus? And I want to guide you in this prayer. And he repeats, I invite you into this place in my heart that it feels wounded and hurt. And he's repeating as he's crying. And then we say, Jesus, this is what I have heard from my peers, from my friends at school about my name. What do you have to say about my name? And then I just got quiet and began to pray internally, Jesus, you better come for my son. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up. He said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. That was from Matthew 17, 1 through 8. Welcome back, friends. This is Stacey Eldridge here in the Wild at Heart studio, and we are doing a series on Jesus stories. This is the fourth episode this week of June 28th. And I hope that you are being as encouraged as I am, just hearing the company of saints telling stories of how Jesus has showed up and moved in their lives. This also helps us see how he has showed up and moved in our own lives. Today in the studio with me is John Eldridge, my husband, of course, and Pablo and Juanita Cerrone. Pablo, Juanita, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having us. It's an honor to be here. Yes, we're so happy to be here with you guys. I'm really looking forward to this. Friends, if you have dialed into the Wild at Heart and the Captivating Experience, then Pablo and Juanita are familiar to you. And if you haven't yet, gang, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Free on our homepage on the website, Six-part beautiful film series for men on Wild at Heart, for women on Captivating, and Pablo and Juanita are in there, and their stories are in there, which is really neat. Which are powerful and beautiful, and you're going to want to watch those. You're going to want to watch them. Yes, thank you, So welcome, guys. I was trying to think this morning, when did you guys come into our orbit? When When did our lives intersect? It's it's a long story. For us, it started around the year 2004 when we were not doing well at all, uh, both individually and as a couple. We were experiencing tremendous hardship and struggles and crying out to God for an answer. You guys and, are in Florida at that point? Yes, yes. We, were, we were living in Miami, Florida. We had been married just for a couple of years. 
and we didn't know you know all the challenges that that uh, we would have to face and we didn't we didn't have anyone around us that would guide us and help us and at that time God brought into my life a, an amazing man who introduced me to the wild at heart message and fought for my heart for a while and and began and that's how the journey of restoration started for me I began to bring some of those categories for Juanita and share captivating with her. And God has been doing this work of restoration for what is now, 18 years, I 18 think. 18 years, <laughs> yes. So beautiful. 18 yeah. years. And so, wow. Mm -hmm. While at hard boot camps and captivating, captivating weekends, and then the Become Good Soil Intensive was part of our lives. And we have been tracking with you guys since then. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's so good. It's so beautiful. Yeah, our lives have forever been changed by this message. And you went Florida to Silicon Valley? Yes. Is that yes. how the well, story goes? Well, it started in Colombia, where we were both born and raised, then Miami, Florida, where we lived for 12 years uh, after we got married, then the Bay Area for five, and for the f last five years, we've been here in Colorado. Yeah. 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 So this is home, Colorado. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And you guys just came off of a pretty exciting weekend yes filled with Jesus stories you out of this work out of what God's done in your lives uh, Paulo and Juanita have started their own ministry yes. and you guys do retreats and events and things primarily for men right yes. now and so you're just fresh off a weekend yeah ministering to men we just came down the mountain and it was absolutely beautiful breathtaking uh, Jesus came to fight for 42 men, and we could make a two-month podcast series on <laughs> just the stories of what right. happened this week, and it was absolutely breathtaking right. and beautiful, and we're honored to be a part of that. Did you see Jesus this weekend? Oh, yes, 24-7. He loves to come for his boys and bring restoration and to bring um, men back to the heart of the Father to take the rightful place as sons, to know that they are valued and loved and uh, that he's intervening in their lives even when they don't see him. Mm. Which so, is your story. Which is my story. And you had the fellow that rescued your heart yeah. in Miami yes. was at this weekend. Yeah, and that's a crazy story. He fought for me for the first few years of my journey of restoration, and then we lost contact for 10 years until last year when Juanita and I were flying back to Miami and we thought it was going to be just a, like a romance trip and some vacation. And very quickly we realized, no, we need to track him down and let him know the ripple effect of his choices. Really? How what he did in our lives has evolved and has um, grown into our lives being fully restored and, and, and our children and the ministry even. And so we got in touch with him and we let him know about the retreats that we are hosting now. We invited him to come. And this weekend he was there with, with us, with his friends, with his band of brothers from Miami, Florida, which as you can imagine was the greatest honor for me. And uh, Morgan from your team, from the Wild at Heart team was there as well. And together we, we were just blown away by the way in which Jesus has shown up throughout the course of our lives, in the big things, but also in the small things, when we don't know that he's there uh, orchestrating and weaving a greater story. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the three of us fighting for 42 other men. Uh, Jim, my mentor, shared with Morgan how he had attended one of the first Wild at Heart boot camps ever, and he wanted to come to the first advanced, but he couldn't make it because registrations were full already. So he grabbed the phone and called Wild at Heart, and the guy who picked up the phone was Morgan, 18, 19 years ago. And he said, I think I'm supposed to be at that retreat. And so Morgan's answer was, okay, if you think you're supposed to be here, then you're supposed to be here. And sent him a registration. He came. His God got on fire. He wanted to fight for men. And so he came back to Miami and he's asking God, what do I do? And he began to create this space for men to come into his house. And that's when I met him. We were in a business meeting and he heard me say the word blessed about something. I was blessed by something. And so he asked, are you a believer? And I said, yes. And he didn't know how much I needed him or how much I needed Jesus and a rescue. 
and and he decided to fight for my heart and he began mm -hmm. mentoring me as a result of what happened for him in that weekend so wow. it, it is crazy this weekend god was like allowing us to see what's happening behind the scenes on for for me these small interactions here and there sometimes even feel random but behind the curtain god was orchestrating a story like he's orchestrating a story for all of us and this weekend i got to see a little bit of of mine and ours and i'm just blown away <laughs> it's so beautiful wow and like you said, Stace, in the beginning, we're telling these stories because it's so encouraging. It is. It is. It shines light on our own lives because I think, yes, I hear and see how he has been working and maneuvering and weaving. And then it makes me go, okay, God, then I just bet you've right. been doing the same thing Yes, for yeah, my life. Yeah. yeah. So, Jesus, even as we tell stories again this week, open our hearts. Yes, God. Mm. Everyone listening, open my heart, Lord, and show me the ways you have been working. I long for more of you. I long to see more of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But also show me how, like in Pablo and Juanita's story, you have been working for years, Lord, as we talk today about some fresh stories. Yes, what you're saying is so true, John, because as we're preparing to do the podcast, I'm shocked when I go back to my files of memory, how God has showed up for us. And at the same time, I was saddened because we get caught up in our lives, in our to-do list, and we kind of forget that Jesus is at work 24-7. And so this preparing for the podcast made me stop and really ponder on, okay, Jesus, this is where you have shown up, and here, and here, and here, and not only for me, for my boys, for Pablo, in our marriage. And so it was beautiful to just praise him and give him the glory yes. for what he has done, for what he is doing. And I know that he will continue that forever. Yeah. And so that's beautiful to know. And it does, it does take stopping and thinking about it. Because I invited, you know, last week we had part of the staff in on the on the podcast. And when I first asked them, they're like, I don't have any Jesus <laughs> stories. I'm like, I know you have dozens yes. of Jesus stories. But in the moment, right. we forget. So, wait, wait, in the moment, what? we forget. So do you have a talk to give at last weekend? You don't know what you're going to share. Jesus wakes you up. You're up at five. Well, how does that story go? Okay, so Pablo and I have a session the last day of the retreat, and I am supposed to share a fresh story in our marriage um, to explain styles of relating. And so I know that I have to give this session, and I'm praying months before, God, show me what you want me to share, and I hear silence. And I'm, okay. Months go by. We're like two weeks before. Oh, you know, two weeks before this retreat, and I have nothing. One day before, and I have nothing. And I'm thinking, okay, God, I have to trust that I'm not going to be here and make a fool of myself and that you're in control and you have a portion for me and for this man. And I go to bed the night before my session. I pray. I'm asking Jesus, please show up. And I fall asleep. I wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning kind of nervous because my session is in four hours. And I pray and I said, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, refresh my memory. Just tell me what am I supposed to share with this man, with your man? And boom, two minutes later, he gives me a memory, a fresh memory that happened three weeks before with Pablo. And it's so fresh and so true that I began feeling the real emotions and feelings of this event. And I look at Pablo, who's next to me, and I'm angry at him. <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus, I cannot share something and be angry at Pablo. But God gave me the opportunity to forgive Pablo in that moment. And I forgave him. And I told Pablo, I love you. 
even though he didn't know what was going on in my heart, he just heard me say, I love you. But it was just a way to tell you, I, I forgive you mm -hmm. for what happened three weeks ago. And then I shared this with the man and it was a holy moment. And it made me realize that, first of all, I don't have control of outcomes. Second, that he is in control. And no matter how much I prepare and make things work on my own rules, at the end of the day, his will will be done. And it's always more than what I expected. Yes. Yes. And so mm -hmm. he showed up for me oh, and for this man mm -hmm. in an amazing way. I love yeah. about that, that if you had known two months before, then you would have prepared in your own way. You would have had your own script. And instead, Jesus waited until he wanted himself to be revealed for it to be fresh and true and real. And that's how he could come for the hearts of men. Okay, this is actually super helpful for me right now because I have a book due this year <laughs> that I haven't written a single word on it yet. I have no, I mean, I think I have some idea what what God wants in the book, but I'm like, right, Jesus, right. Thank you for the story. <laughs> That's who you are. That's how, it's not that you always take us, you know, to the wire, but you know the timing. Mm. You know that I will hear from you. Yes. So thanks. I ne I needed that. It's trustworthy. I needed that story this morning. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, Juanita, like, um, when did you begin to experience Jesus? coming for you like that? When, like, what's the early stories of Jesus showing up for your heart? Oh, I have a beautiful story. And it was at the beginning of my journey with God. Pablo and I had just been married. We were two years in our marriage. And I had, and I still have, a passion for the ocean. Mm -hmm. That's where I find freedom. That's where I meet Jesus. And a passion for dolphins. And I said, well, I want to become a marine biologist. And I re registered at FIU to become a marine biologist. And I began to take my courses. And I was so excited. Number one, because I will probably get to do what I would love to do is just immerse in the water literally and do that as a job. And if I ever get a chance to work with dolphins, that would be a dream come true. And the second part was, and I, this is a way to prove my dad that I have what it takes, that I am smart, and to prove him wrong. And so I was hoping this is the way to prove my dad with my degree and also fulfill my dreams by working with dolphins. And so I register, and I'm happy, my backpack, I go to class every day, and final test, and I failed the basics classes, like biology and chemistry. Mm. And I'm bummed and I'm, yes, making agreements. Dad was right. I don't have what it takes, but I'm going to prove him wrong. And so I register the next semester. I take my courses. I stay after school, tutoring, studying, studying, studying. And I felt again. Oh. oh. And I'm crushed. Mm. I have to prove my dad that, I, that he's wrong. And I register again. And I go to school and I do this over and over again. And I failed and I got suspended from the university. And internally, I'm going through a war because... There's a truth about myself that God speaks over me, but the proof tells me otherwise, that I'm smart, that I have what it takes. And in this moment, it's not true for me, no. that I have what it takes. And what about my dreams of working with dolphins and becoming a marine biologist? What about that? And I put it in a drawer. And I said, yep, maybe that was right. And then Jesus. Paula and I were watching the news, you know, 
breaking news. A hundred dolphins just stranded in the Florida Keys. Some are already dead, but some need rescue. We need volunteers. And Pablo and I look at each other, and I call the number right away. And I said, I want to volunteer. And they said, yes. So I ended up going to this place where they had two dolphins, and they invited me to help them restore, uh, rehabilitate these dolphins, oh. and I get to jump in the water with <gasps> them, put sunblock on them, help the vets and the biologists, you know, do their blood work, feed them, and I get to take care of these two dolphins for a whole summer. <gasps> <gasps> what? <laughs> what? Uh, and I, this is happening. I'm not thinking Jesus is in it. I'm just experiencing this and just, you know, becoming alive with it. I'm just going through the moment, but my heart is so full, so full. They even taught me how to do necropsies. So whenever there was a dead dolphin, unfortunately, uh -huh. we had the opportunity to look inside the body and see maybe study what caused these 100 dolphins to be stranded. And I was part of that with this group of scientists. And I'm just like, I, I only have a high school diploma. And when this ended, uh, these dolphins got well and they were going to be released into the wild. There were probably in my section with this biologist, 30 volunteers. And they said, we can only invite two volunteers to release the dolphins. And they chose me. <laughs> and so I'm with the Coast Guards in the middle of the ocean oh. and the scientists releasing these two dolphins. And I jumped into the water first. And then I go under the water and then they release these two dolphins. And I see them just go away. Oh. And I say my goodbyes. And I... In this moment, I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> and two things happened. Number one, God cares about my dreams. He cares so much yes. that I get, I get the chance to live my dream, not with a degree or four years later, but that same summer. Yeah. And then later on, I realized that he was actually saving me because there's no way I can prove my dad that I had what it takes or that I'm smart with the diploma. That's not up to me. And I released that to God. And I realized I will never be able to prove this to my dad. Because first of all, God showed me that I don't need a diploma to prove myself that I'm smart. Yeah. Or that I have what it takes. And that made me realize I need to stop striving to prove that. Mm. That is such an intimate story. Holy cow. And a whole summer? It wasn't like going out for a day, be one of the tourists on the beach watching it. Like to get in and have that relationship. You should have seen her like four in the morning. She's up. It's my shift. I'm going. And off she goes. And she's just in her element. It was absolutely outstanding. Her heart coming alive, and I would see Jesus restoring Juanita mm. and setting her free as she is doing that for the dolphins. Mm. It was absolutely breathtaking, beautiful. It's, it's stunning. It's just stunning how you, what you came away with, that God sees your heart, mm. that he cares about your dreams, and the deeper things that you have nothing to prove mm. to your earthly father to release that, mm. to not have to arrange or strive or have that be a burden over your heart. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Yay, God. Yeah. Gosh, it's connecting a dot for me on a story that I, I've forgotten for a long time. So without getting into a huge part of the history, many of our listeners or readers know that Stacy and I have a background in the theater. And we thought that the theater would be our lives. Like it was what our training was in, our degrees were in. And we ran a small theater company, live theater company, and, and we loved it. And when it closed down because of some heartache and some betrayal and some things, I was really lost. I, I just thought, God, I thought that was it. I mm. thought that was our destiny. And I thought that was, 
what we were called to do, and it really threw me. And it, but I kind of just tucked all that away. We went on with life, lots of Jesus stories in there. But then we're at one of the first sacred romance conferences, and we had designed this incredibly beautiful stage, these gorgeous tapestries, these candelabras, the music playing. Like we had created, a, you know, a, an experience for people to encounter Jesus. And I'm up in the upper balcony watching it unfold. And I realized, oh, you redeemed all that. Yeah. Wow. Like, like that wasn't wasted. Like that wow. was part of our story and, and obviously our public speaking and, and that kind of thing. And Jesus, you were in it the whole time. Yes. So like university didn't work out, but Jesus, you were in it. Theater didn't work out, but Jesus, you were in it and guiding and redeeming. Mm. And yeah, wow, that's beautiful. A couple of weeks ago on the podcast, we were talking about how beautiful it is to watch Jesus come for your kids. And it's actually easier to teach children to hear the voice of Jesus than it is adults because they don't have all the no. <laughs> in there, in the, in the wounding, in the history, in the yada yada yada, and to see God come and speak for your kids, which happened recently for your oldest boy. Yeah, for for Mateo. For Mateo. Uh, yeah, he's ten, and at the beginning of the year, he began to share that he had like a stomach ache. He didn't want to go to school. He wanted to stay home, and that happened once, and then twice, and then the third day, and so we began to ask. Buddy, what's what's going on? And then he broke open and finally said, I, I just can't go to school anymore. What's going on, buddy? And so he shared how for the last two and a half years at school, some kids had been making fun of his name. Mateo is Matthew in Spanish. And a lot of the kids had uh, trouble saying the word correctly. And so it became the joke. They began to make fun of his name in different ways. And he was experiencing just this deep and profound shame around he, his name, his identity. And he just couldn't, couldn't take it anymore. So he didn't want to go to school again. That broke my heart, right? One of the things that we're paying a lot of attention to is how to fight for our kids' hearts. Mm -hmm. And this is something that has been going of on course. for two and a half years. It just Gosh. broke our, our own hearts. But I'm, I'm sitting with him. He comes and sits on my lap and he's crying, sobbing. And I just feel unequipped to handle him at the time, other than simply letting him cry and, and, and having my, my strong arms around him. And so I ask him, why, why don't we pray, buddy? Why don't we, why don't we bring this before Jesus? And I want to guide you in this prayer. And I say, Jesus, we invite you into this wounded place in my heart. I release this to you. This is what these kids have been saying about my name. What do you want to say? You're guiding him in prayer, in prayer. right now. Okay. I'm saying this and he's repeating this okay. after me. Okay. And so, Jesus, we release this to you. And he repeats, I invite you into this place in my heart that it feels wounded and hurt. And he's repeating as he's crying. And then we say, Jesus, this is what I have heard from my peers, from my friends at school about my name. What do you have to say about my name? And then I just got quiet and began to pray internally, Jesus, you better come for my son. You better come for my son because obviously all my doubts and yes. will you show up and will you speak because of my own story and my own wounding, but he doesn't have that. And so he closed his eyes and then there was like a 30 second pause. And I said, buddy, do you see Jesus? Yes. We're in an open field. Okay. Tell me more. What is he doing? My son loves snakes, by the way. And so he says, Jesus has a snake in, on his hands, and he's giving it to me. And on the mouth of the snake, there is a note. Okay, do you want to pick it up? <laughs> <laughs> and so he picks up the note, and Jesus says, it, it, the note has his name on it, Mateo. And Jesus tells him, your name will change the world. I didn't know what to do with that. Oh like, my. This is Mateo, my son, 10-year-old, reporting back to me what Jesus is telling him about his identity and his name. And so it was not the end of the story, but that was the beginning of the healing, right? So I told him, buddy, you have to go to your bedroom and draw everything that you just saw. 
And he went on, he drew it, and he has it on his wall. And that's his reminder that his name will change the world. His identity will come and God will wow. use him to change the world. And so Juanita and I went to the school and we shared with the principal what was happening and with the teachers. And these are a group of phenomenal people. So they were... You as, mean about the teasing yes, and stuff? Yes, and okay. the bullying. Yeah. And so they came to support us and we need to change this. This cannot happen in our school. They were as supportive as a group of people could be. And they had some conversations with the kids and with the teachers around, you know, being kind to each other and the effect of words on each other. And they ask, is anyone else experiencing what Mateo has been experiencing? And kids began to raise their hands. Me too, me too. They were ashamed and fearful and they didn't want to bring that up, but they had been under the same um, circumstances. Yeah. And so everything began to change to them. And then Mateo was made aware, like, oh my God, I raised my hand. I shared what was happening. I shared what was happening with my name. And through it, Jesus is changing these people's lives, these kids, my friends. Wow. And, right? <laughs> I was the happiest man alive. I don't have to figure it out. Number one, <laughs> Jesus comes for my son. <laughs> and he's there. He's there if we have eyes to see him. Mm. Oh, glory. And, and to take the risk. Yeah. In that moment, yes. he's on your lap. There's tears. Jesus, will you speak? Yes. Right? We, like to take those risks yeah. to make room for God. Yeah. And I have to confess, it came from a position of not knowing what to do. How do I guide my son in this place? Jesus, would you come? Yeah. And he came. So yes. I just got myself out of the way. Beautiful. Yeah. Guys, as you're thinking about your early life with God, this wasn't really a part of things. It yeah, wasn't not at all. It wasn't a part of, of our experience. We loved church. We loved our fellowship. We were in great groups and, and all of that. But it was something that we grew into over time. What, what has opened up your heart to this? If you were offering a word of encouragement to someone, how did it happen? How, how did you get in touch with Jesus like this? I, I will say for me that with little things, what my eyes can see. So it could be a flower, a verse, a song, and you know when it just pierces your heart and you just feel your heart reacting in an really good emotional way as a result of uh, that flower or that song. That's Jesus' voice. Yes. Yeah. His voice is not only vocal, but in a flower, in the wind, mm. in the sounds of the waves, mm -hmm. in a dolphin. Yeah, that's yes. good. That's yes. good. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, um, it's something I had to cultivate but I was provoked into it mm. by hearing other people's stories. And so actually, I hope this kind of provokes our listeners because it made me want it. Like, how, how are you hearing from God or what he's giving you a flower and you know that's from him? Or I remember early on when the kids were really young, our sons were young and waking up in the morning, not in a good place and not knowing. John was traveling and didn't know how he was going to make it through this day and just reached for my Bible, opened it up, and suddenly I'm in Isaiah. My eyes fall on the verse, mm. God is within her. She will not fall. Mm. <sighs> so like just those personal, I know that it's him. I know that he's coming for me. And then asking, asking for more. And John was really ahead of me on this, of, of his experiences of tangible expressions of God's love. And so I would start asking, I want that. That's what I mean by being provoked, like being made hungry. Yes. I need that. I want it. God, speak to me. And so it meant then that I had to start looking yes. and ask him to give me the eyes to recognize mm. where he is moving on my behalf. And then I began to see it. Yes. Mm. But first I had to ask. Mm. Yes, I think for me, I relate a lot uh, to that, Stacy. It started with me wondering, could this be true? Yes. And which I think was an open door for Jesus to heal my own belief. 
Mm-hmm. And as I began to ask that question more, could this be true? Could it be, could, could it be true that he wants to speak to me, that he wants to reveal himself to me in the daily, in mm-hmm. the small things? And John, I remember you teaching on this or sharing on how we can develop a, a love language with God. Yes. I remember when I heard that the first time, I was like, what? A love language, specifically for me, a way in which he wants to love me and show up for me that is unique to who I am. Could that be true? Mm. Jesus, if that is true, would you show me? Would you show me how you have been showing up for me? Would you show me today where you are? Would you show me where you were in the memories? And little by little, as Juanita was saying, start with a little. For me, I remember a time of crisis. We're about to move from the Bay Area to Colorado, and I'm, I'm like filled with anxiety. Am I doing the right thing? Am I rooting my family? And I'm washing, I'm in the backyard washing some playground that we were traveling with for, for our kids. And God began to develop this love language with me through hummingbirds. And I chose to believe, yeah, this is not just me seeing some hummingbirds. God's speaking to me. I could feel the effect, the fruit of that in my heart, right? A hope and, and joy and just experience. God is with me. So anyway, as I'm washing this playground, in the anxiety and in the questions, Jesus, we're about to take this truck and drive it to Colorado. Are you in this? A hummingbird came and began to drink from the hose I was using <laughs> to water this playground. Okay, Jesus, you're, you're here. Oh, you're, you're the one leading us. Yes. I can trust that you yeah. are with me, that Emmanuel yeah. life, life yeah. is with yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. Okay, gang. Um, listeners, I want to give you something new to try as well. Ask Jesus to show you the kingdom. Mm. You know, Mateo is in prayer and he sees Jesus in a field with him and the snake has a note in its mouth. <laughs> and, and Jesus is infinitely able to do that. Creative, playful, personal. Yes. Ask him, like, Lord, I want to see more. I, I want to see the kingdom. I want to see you. I mm. want to show me. Yes. And as you ask, be open over the weeks ahead to the things that he has for you. This has been so rich, so rich. So can I pray that for Please. the— Great. Um, join me in prayer, friends. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I want a love language with you. I want to recognize your unique pursuit of me and the love notes that you give me. So, Jesus, would you help me to see you? Would you help me to see the kingdom? Would you help me to recognize your love for me in tangible ways, whether that's a flower or a song, a hummingbird? You know the particulars of what moves my heart. So come for me, Jesus. Open my eyes. I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 